Welcome to the one with Ben all to another episode of Interverse. It's a stormy early spring evening with night just beginning to fall. And what better time to stare directly into the twilight with our good friend Gabriel, a guest who likely needs no introduction if you've been watching my stuff for any length of time. But he deserves no less than a lengthy list of laudatory language because via his internet persona known as Slick Dissident, Gabriel has become a majorly positive influence on the syncretism side of the podcasting tribes with outrageously original occult outlooks on just about everything under the sun or moon. And one of the latest and greatest accolades for our cipher shattering superhero Gabe is his novel way of interpreting the configuration of these here United States juxtaposing archetype with geomancy inspiring viewers of his YouTube channel for quite some time now with a system he calls tarot Tories calling upon the major arcana and applying the hero's journey through the 22 cards to the 50 U S States may be a Kabbalistic bridge too far for some at first. So if you feel the itch to dismiss this idea or change the channel, please first ask yourself what other systems of correspondence you might already subscribe to. And ponder for a moment that perhaps the first druid to discover the as above so below blueprint linking individual species of tree to specific planetary powers or the first to consider a system of chakras each with a color might have seemed far out at first too, possibly taboo when these ideas originated. But when we begin to see nature through eyes informed by the template of wholeness, the synchromystic synesthesia of our senses begins to reveal symmetry everywhere, within and without. From holographic blood that forms images of a person's unhealthy organs via shaping their blood cells to demonstrate where the problem is, to the doctrine of signatures that allows herbalists to know which types of plants are best for which conditions by considering what parts of the body different plants look most like, we are tale-telling creatures who see the same story in every territory. And it's our story, the hero's journey. And since government is the realm of fiction, it's no stretch of my imagination to see more than enough evidence to grant massive value to Gabriel's tarot Tories, which we're about to explore in great depth. Make sure you check the show notes and the uh, episode right now for the links to Gabriel's amazing YouTube channel, Slick Dissident. You can find it under that name. We also do a lot of work together on Weaving Spiders. Welcome. Have been doing that for months. And <laughs> if you're not watching that yet and you like this type of content, do yourself a favor and go catch up. Maybe go back like 20 episodes and spend a <laughs> few years <laughs> catching up on the five hour live streams, but super worth it. Also, don't forget, you can get the second hour, possibly longer of this conversation with Gabriel on my Rockfin or Patreon. Thank you so much for everyone already supporting, but. Man, I had a lot of words that I crammed into those three minutes. Let's go ahead and get into it, Gabriel. Welcome back to Interverse, my man. Thanks for being here. Absolutely, Chance. Thank you, brother. That was beautiful. That was an absolutely beautiful intro. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so today we are definitely delving into that uh, the, the second hermetic principle of correspondence. And that's going to be a very helpful uh a starting point for a lot of people. You know, one thing that has helped me uh, with symbolic literacy is uh, adopting more of a both and perspective and the ability to say, yes, it is this, but it is also more. And finding nested meanings in correspondences uh, is definitely up to my, uh, my symbolic literacy, which has led me to this a uh, wonderful uh, realization of real powerful correspondence of the sky clock, bringing it down onto the map that we're given of the realm that we're in and seeing how the symbols uh, overlap in the 12 stations of the sky. has been really uh, gratifying, quite an adventure. Thanks for giving me a platform to bring it all together and share. Yeah, I think this is going to be really fun because you've had a lot of time to work this out in your head. And a lot of the videos you put out, I've noticed that you're kind of researching your own mind as you are doing the video. Like you may have come in with points that you wanted to make, but you're watching Slick Dissident as the witness and you're observing this and more things are firing off and connections are being made. So it's like your own work is your own expression of your observations becomes research in and of itself for you. It's really weird. I, I don't know if I described that correctly, but it's what I see happening. So to be able to 
take all of that that's been going on for months with the territory system and bring it all together into one video or as best as we can. It might be too big. We're going to do our best. I think it's going to be awesome. So yeah, yeah, you just tell me where you want to get started. Nice. Uh, I coined a new phrase to describe my channel, uh, the shared learning experience. (laughs) <laughs> I think that sums that up pretty nicely because I do. Uh, I'm often making realizations on the fly. Uh, so um, we can I want to say too, what you brought out about the yes and is so crucial for this type of thing because yeah. otherwise you'll fall into a dogmatic perspective somewhere. And, you know, just we got to be able to entertain ideas that we don't fully agree with or disagree with multiple yeah. at the same time, or we're never going to get out of <laughs> what we're currently in. Yeah, man. Yaki and Boaz, 50-50 true-false system. Mm-hmm. So true. So true. So uh, essentially, the day that this started to come together for me, I was listening to uh, Ross Ben and Michael Wan uh, rap about some uh, old world uh, power structures, you know, and the possibility of the Moors having a lot more uh, relationship to the Americas and even the name Amorica, and uh, that there may have been an African queen or a Nubian queen, a black queen in uh, California. In that relating to the name of California, it's a Khalifa, a golden Khalifa. Um, and, you know, Ross Ben was just uh, waxing beautifully about this uh, goddess in California. And it just occurred to me that, you know, the tarot card for uh, Pisces is the Empress. And uh, if I put the Zodiac onto the map, Pisces lands in Southern California. And so that was kind of the gateway for me. That was the liminal space where I was holding on to both worlds and began to fuse the two worlds together. And I realized, now, if I can put the Empress in Khalifa of California, what happens 180 degrees away, the, the reflection of that on the other side of the global map as it's given to us? And uh, right away, I saw uh, correspondence, live and direct. I was looking at um, these uh, closed-off territories, which are uh, known as Tibet, where there's a lot of um, abstinence of worldly attachments, you know, uh, in so many ways. Uh, But also Tibet was a closed off uh, civilization, you know, recluse from the world, a lot of hermits in that culture. And wouldn't you know, over on the Virgo side of the constellations, the corresponding tarot card is the hermit card. So then I just kind of spread that that concept out a little more. And I see Korea, you know, North Korea is a closed off country, not they're hermetically sealed. Their borders seal them off. We've got the Great Wall of China, which is a seal, sealing people off. And even Japan culturally had hundreds of years, allegedly, where they were, uh, you know, closed off. And so that's where I started to branch this whole system out. So I did the, I took the, uh, the Zodiac and the tarot cards in their stations corresponding with the Zodiac as it goes around and uh, started to find uh, everything that I'm going to try to lay out for you today. But it was months later that I heard the word uh, a hermetic kingdom. And a hermetic kingdom is a, it's a, just a catchphrase to describe countries that are closed off. And uh, so I looked it up, and sure enough, they are talking about all of the territories I was just talking about as hermetic kingdoms, uh, North Korea, Japan, Tibet. Um, So they all have a powerful relationship to the hermit card and and Virgo. So I did it with the world, with the globe, and I found a lot. I found plenty. Uh, But then I also was simultaneously having the realizations that it also fits on Uh, the United States map. And one thing that became really important was determining the dividing lines, you know, where to send her, where to center this map. Um, So here I'll uh, try to share. Can you see my screen here? 
Yeah, I'm going to bring that up in a, just a second. I want to use this moment to let everyone know that's just listening on the RSS feed. There is a video version of this, and we're going to do our best to describe it. But when we're looking at maps, you know, easier if you can see it. <laughs> so hop on over to my Rockfin or my Odyssey, yeah. or I guess my BooTube, whatever, whatever floats your boat. But before we jump into that, I just got to say I'm drinking this Chaga tea. Chaga is really famous in a place that it that uh, nesting dolls are named after and <laughs> we're not allowed to say they're not allowed to be that that type of ne uh, nesting doll anymore <laughs> we got to ban that and cancel that but my my uh, point of saying that is that i have Khalifa brand oat milk in this in this oh, drink my goodness you know like that archetype does still kind of hang out in the collective there's a brand of non dairy milks that is named after it that's kind of decent actually so yeah uh, getting into this idea i want to also lay down one more thing before we look at the maps is that neither of us is saying that this was like design this is by some human mastermind design right now maybe other people have witnessed this phenomenon or maybe there is influence from specific people on this that were attempting to utilize it as a help their magical workings because they understand that the more things you can line up in correspondence, the more effective a magical working might be. Yep. But I think generally you and I would probably agree that things like this actually just happen as an expression of archetype through our psyche in the things that we create because humans created these boundaries. They created these cards. This is the, the major arcana depicts the story of human consciousness, soul growth and evolution and its cyclical spiral path. Yep. So when we apply this to the map, we're not saying it is or it isn't on purpose. <laughs> some, like, it's probably some impossible to fully decipher blend of the two. Right. And also maybe on purpose from a realm outside of this realm. Like we're not outside, but invisible to our particular sense configuration, mm -hmm. right? That spiritual forces may have had something to do with this too. So yeah. who knows? It's just the fact is these patterns are there and that's what we're pointing out. So that we can one more way, one, one more time explain how really everything is everything and all life is interconnected and it's all the story of you. <laughs> well said, very well said. Yes. I like to like consummate what seems to some people as diametrically opposed uh, ideal ideologies. Um, you know, the hermetics call it as above, so below, as within, so without. Um, and then the Christians, they say the same thing. They just say it in different words, you know, as on earth as it is in heaven, you know. And so those two, those two ideologies are uh, from the same breed. It's all, it's all correspondence. What other ways of saying, you know, articulating the power of correspondence? Unless it's been Mandela affected already since we last looked at it. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to go there. That's what we were talking about before we came on. Okay, um, so whenever you're ready, I'll pull up the, the screen share and right just on. get the map going. I see it. So here we go. Nice. So this is uh, just starting from the macro. Uh, I will try to describe why the 37th parallel is my, uh, it's my dividing line. It's my baseline for the whole map. And um, the part of the reason is because it is the Mason-Dixon line. And so it has been christened with many years of bloodshed along this very magical parallel. Um, I was describing a scene uh, today. I did a show with uh, Don Onaki, and um, I was describing that many of the uh, soldiers along the Mason-Dixon line fighting in the Civil War their final moments, uh, they were, there's this, uh, a typical practice of emptying your pockets before you die. So a soldier along this 37th parallel uh, in his last throes of his, uh, of his life is emptying his pockets so he doesn't have material attachments. And one of the very famous articles from his pockets would be a deck of playing cards. And he would uh, spend his last energy throwing the cards as far away from himself as possible so as not to be incriminated when he got in front of the gates of St. Peter 
he could come as clean and as pure as possible. Well, that means that this parallel, this 37th degree parallel, is not only christened with blood, but also with cards, playing cards spread all across the fields all through that war. So that's just something to think about as we uh, substantiate the magic of the correspondence of this 37th degree parallel. And it cuts just through the Strait of Gibraltar, which is in and of itself uh, the gates. That's a, a going through a major threshold where so much energy and so much trade uh, was going in and out of the Mediterranean Sea here. And uh, it cuts, I believe, north of Jerusalem by uh, about four degrees. Uh, it goes, I think, right through the Echidna Islands, which is a place of interest for the spiders, for sure. Um, and then uh, somewhere in here is Afghanistan. I don't know, one of these, I think, is Afghanistan. I'm not really savvy, but um, just as we cut through that uh, Middle East and Eur uh, Eurasia here, under the Black Sea, uh, I guess we're going to go in through Turkey and Pakistan here. But uh, anyway, the, my point is the 37th degree parallel is also crucial to the marijuana industry because uh, what is called guerrilla growers who, uh, you know, grow marijuana off the radar, um, they would send seed scouts to Afghanistan along the 37th degree parallel because they needed those seeds to have the perfect light spectrum to correspond with the light spectrum and seasonal needs here in the United States. So the seeds of ganja uh, were harvested from the 37th parallel in Afghanistan and then uh, brought here to America to grow along that, uh, that very sacred location. So that kind of gives a, a perspective the macro perspective on why the 37th degree parallel is my dividing line. And you could call that my spring equinox and my fall equinox, that horizontal dividing line. And here I'll bring up a picture of, this is kind of my, uh, my zodiac with all of the tarot cards uh, from the Thoth deck. And it, I know a lot of people have different perspectives of how the Zodiac should be represented. Uh, but one thing we can all agree on is that it f generally flows in this aspect is like a clock, clockwise, as we go through time. Um, so you can see my mouse, right? Yeah, yeah. And so like a clock through from Aries all the way to Pisces yeah. at the end. Yeah. And then, yep, comes full circle. So I've done and a some little people bit would uh, like a lot of depictions of the zodiac don't actually put Cancer, Gemini, that that axis at the top, right? But they, we have reasons for that as well. Yeah, <laughs> there's so many things about this that we would have reason yeah. to explain if we wanted to. Yes, there is. There's a lot of variations of this sequence, so to say. Um, but one thing I think about, and it kind of helps other people who maybe aren't. Uh, aren't into the Zodiac or, you know, the system. Um, I think of the circle as the hill of Golgotha. And I think of this cardinal cross, the first cross, the red cross here, is uh, the cross of Christ. And there are two other crosses on the hill of Golgotha. And so if you see how color-coded they are, the red cross is Christ's cross. The blue cross is the uh, penitent thief. And the green cross would be the non-penitent thief. Yeah, so three crosses would in a wheel would give you 12 demarcations, 12 divisions like the zodiac for audio yeah. people. Yes, thank you. Yep. Yeah. And the uh the non-penitent thief, the thief who was not had no regrets and was determined to stay the course, he represents the cardinal signs. He is the uh, all of the cardinal uh, symbols. Uh, just as you uh, break across an equinox or a solstice, you're in a cardinal sign. Then Jesus is representing the fixed sign, the crucifix. And the mutable sign, the most likely to change, is the final one in the flow of the sequence of three. And that is the remittent or the penitent thief 
because he's most likely to change. He's mutable. He's going to change his tune. So those three symbols, the uh, fi cardinal, fixed, and mutable symbols, repeat four times as you go around the wheel of the hill of Golgotha. So I think that's a really helpful metaphor for people to kind of understand some of the dynamics of, uh, of the Zodiac and the 12 stations. Um, and these tarot cards, um, they flow uh, in a clockwise fashion, and they have two layers to them. And I'm going to actually pull up a, maybe a cleaner image to show the two layers and give good reasoning why they're organized the way they are. Um, let's see. Yeah, and that's where things get more, um, I say, advanced. Murky advanced because mm -hmm. different teachers and systems will actually start to have differences between what yeah. major arcana go to which zodiacal sign or maybe some yes. go to multiple or certain could apply to all like the world or the wheel mm -hmm. potentially so yeah you really gotta just be open-minded to <laughs> some of them have quite obvious correspondence but mm -hmm. others you know, maybe there could be reason to to differ from yep. system to system, and so we're just go we're just going with what we've got here, and this is one way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah, and that's a really good point. You know, because uh, you know, like uh, Crowley came along and changed whole names of cards and rearranged. He was mostly order. wrong, I think. <laughs> I think I think so too. I like to kind of fly in the face of that and stick to the uh, rider weight flow uh, prim primarily. Um, so this image is probably a nice synopsis or a nice run through. Uh, and you can see the red line is the 37th degree parallel. And so on the uh, left hand side of the screen will be like the spring equinox, your birthday tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, that's true. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. As we break through the, uh, that parallel and then. Um, my uh, summer solstice is essentially marcated by the Mississippi River. And you can, I mean, just you can see my mouse kind of tracking up and down the Mississippi. I think it splits almost right where Chicago is, going from the mouth of the Mississippi in um, Louisiana down here and cutting pretty much straight up through Chicago on into Canada, the whole Mississippi makes a general uh, dividing line for the summer solstice above in Chicago and the winter uh, solstice in, down here in Louisiana. Um, and that's just a good way to maybe describe it for uh, the listeners. Uh, and then as the clock rolls through three more stations, we go into the fall equinox over here. Uh, and then we drop three more stations and we come into the winter solstice down below and they rise again to the 37th parallel in the, uh, in the West where we spring up through the season one more time. And so that's just a quick walkthrough on how the uh, X and Y axis lay out. Um, now, one thing that I... Uh, so the reason we're looking at this is because I just want to point out that yeah. in case it wasn't fully clear or people are like, I thought this was about tarot cards and we're talking about Zodiac signs and putting that yeah. on the map. Yes. But it's because the way you would order your Zodiac would also inform the way that these cards will fall on the map. So you want to start there, mm -hmm. start with the 12 and then make the placements of the, what those major arcana story beats would be in those places. and. You know, yeah. getting ahead of things, you can just see though, looking at <laughs> this ellipse that you have of the zodiac signs that you got the ram's horns of Aries sitting right on Colorado, Denver, which that happens to be a mountainous state, and their state animal is a ram, if I'm not mistaken. You got it. The long horned ram is the Denver uh, or the Colorado state animal. You got it. Yep. Stealing uh, your thunder. You got it. Man. No, that's good. That is one of my. That's one of my favorites. It's just it becomes so uh, solid. The more evidence you bring to bear to this, it's really uh, getting more and more substantial with time. So the one card that I don't have uh, 
in this map is the full card. Uh, I uh, left it off the, uh, the cycle here, but it, I believe that the full card belongs in uh, basically in Kentucky, or right at this juncture of the Mississippi where it deviates into the yod or the Y shape, major split right there at the, uh, at the nose, the bottom nose of, the, of Illinois. And there are some very Egyptological cities all through the Mississippi River, such as Memphis, Cairo, uh, or Cairo, some people would say. Um, it becomes a very powerful mirror of Egypt uh, through this area. But I'm, I'm not going to get and into it's interesting that the fool would fall there just because that's the convergence of more corners of states than anywhere else, right? Yes. And it's where all the water flows down to. That like all the waterfalls, all waterfalls, all through the whole water network system of the of the uh, states, they all fall into this central location, and that is uh, very iconic of the Fool card is uh, falling uh, in this spot. So he is like my uh, I think of him as my placenta. <laughs> he is my center place. He is the uh, uh, he's holding the branches of this of this tree uh, of the Mississippi River. So uh, he is a zero. He's not a number. He's a symbol. Uh, and so he's not on the wheel. He is outside of the sequence and flow of numer of numer logic. He's non numer logical, and so he's not on the wheel. He's in the center place. And you so know what's interesting too is in Kentucky, right yeah. in that like far eastern southern corner of the state. Uh huh. There's a major town called Fulton, which you could almost see like that's the fulcrum of this wheel. <laughs> wow. Yes, and it has fool the fool Fulton, the town of the fool. Yeah. So there's that, and yeah. there's also if you remember from watching that documentary series Hellier. They got into some of the ways that Kentucky has like a lot of mental health problems, like yes. mental, like a really full asylum population. Some yes. parts of the state more than others, I think, but there's like one area in the state where they send people from all over the state to. So that in terms of the fool being landing in that region, yep. <laughs> well, the fool, one of the correspondences with the fool would be psychic maladies as in well, mental illness yes. as part of the fool's bioenergetic correspondence there's that's a lot a, there's yeah, a lot of things it could correspond to but that's definitely a big one yeah man that is a lovely weave uh yeah you i think of kentucky the more i learn about you know some of the uh enigmas of that location you know the penny royal research i'm really digging into that right now season two is out and i'm uh yeah, you know, Mark Steves on the uh, my family thinks I'm crazy. He just dropped something uh, this morning on the Penny Royal research, so I got into that. I've already listened to it one and a half times. It's glorious. Wow! Okay, you sent me that. I, I'm going to check it out. Mark's always yeah. doing great stuff. But I got into Mike Wan today and caught up yeah. with him, and he's got great stuff too. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's it's uh, embarrassment of riches, as you say. <laughs> it's so, cool. Um, so. Like you were saying, people in that area have that mental, a lot of mental health issues. Well, I think that Kentucky has been the subject of a of, of vast uh, list of uh, psychological operations throughout time. Uh, and, you know, I'm right now I'm kind of trying to solve the meat showers. What the hell with meat flying, falling from the sky? That's the kind of thing that would make many generations uh, doubt the fabric fabric of reality for years to come. Um, it turns out there actually yeah. there were hot air balloons back then, um, so that's a possibility that they were literally uh, messing with those people uh, to do social experiments with uh, the fallout of dropping meat and frogs and things on people. But yeah, so uh, Kentucky is a keystone to this whole thing. Um, and I'll just do a couple, uh, you know, this is kind of what drew me in the most is the word Kentucky. I find it very rich with twilight potential, twilight language potential. And one interpretation I have of the word Kentucky is 
uh, in Portuguese, the phrase caindo aqui means to fall right here. And, uh, and that is a uh, very symbolic of the fool card, to fall right here. So I'll just kind of do a quick teaser on that because I'm going to spiral out on the map through the couple of arches real quick to give people the layout, the lay of the land. And then I'll start bringing in some like visual evidence and like state seals, uh, mascots of sports teams, and uh, just show that this is a broad framework uh, in the realm of forms and thought forms and egregores of the human consciousness. And uh, my master thesis is basically that this is a structural uh, map or layout or uh, grid of truth, of fundamental truth. And what can be done with this is they can uh, load up the framework of truth with all the bullshit they want you to believe and feed it to you because many people are very truth starved. And if it has the, uh, the that fun foundation of truth, they'll gobble it up. Uh, That's how media has worked forever. Yeah. Yeah. Hollywood does that. Yes. It's like you got to give the rat something edible with the poison in it, not just the poison. You got it, buddy. Yep. Yeah, that's really great. And then if people are still a little bit like, this is a huge stretch. <laughs> Think about it this way. It doesn't have to be something literally factual to your mind to make it useful. Because the way that learning works, and there's obviously so much to know and so many things that we could bring into our field of awareness and symbolic literacy. And the more that we have, the stronger our psychic self-defense becomes against exactly what we just talked about. Well, the way that memory and information works for a human being generally is that what we are able to recall and bring to consciousness is dependent on what other information is convergent with that fact that you have in your mind or in your data banks. So when we look at a system like what you've come up with, you could consider it, if nothing else, a teaching tool because it's giving you a huge web of linkages through which you might be able to pull on the knowledge of correspondences in a new way and have more connections. So it's like the old idea of the more things you know, the more you can know because, yeah. or the more you can remember and explain it. If you only know a little bit about something, it's hard to even ever come back to that. But like the syncretism and generalist mentality, learning a little bit about everything and then keeping throwing stuff on the pile, eventually it gets to the point where you don't know why you or how much you know until you get into a conversation about something and it starts just falling out because you're touching on the places where it links. So I think this system, nice. you know, I just want to keep giving people other alternate ways of looking at the value in this. Cause I, it's uh, it's not your standard way of thinking yeah. for people on the planet right now, but yeah, I think there's so much value there. So, okay. Yeah. Back nice. to you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Yeah. One thing I try to do in a couple spots, a couple of these stations, as I bring examples is I try to bring forward headlines and maybe examples of, uh, 50 percent bullshit burgers that the massive have the masses have uh gobbled right up uh and just show that it is 50 percent truth uh but the other half we as most of us know at this point is uh just what uh they want to steer us to believe um so from the full card in the center right here in the kayendu aki um you know one more quick point is um Daniel Boone National Forest has sightings of a dog man. And the fool card is generally depicted with the dog at his side. So that's just one little uh, teaser, because we'll come back to more substantiation of the Kentucky and the fool card uh, it, it, when, at the end. So card number one is the Magi card. And uh, I see it, uh, you know, dropping down uh, here into Sagittarius. It has correspondence with Sagittarius in the, you know, by the by the tarot book. Um, and then I'm just going to kind of riff through uh, the arc, the arc of the archetypes here. Then we go from Sagittarius. We move into um, Capricorn, and uh, I put the High Priestess in this location. But I associate her more with the actual river of Mississippi because it's the M, M Isis Ippi River. 
And so the high priestess, I see her as representing more the actual dividing line, uh, you know, generating that liminal uh, gate. Um, so she's You know, what's interesting is in um, Michael Tessarion's system, he actually corresponds the fool, the magician, the high priestess, the empress, the emperor, all with Aries. He puts all of those under the Aries category because they're so it's got such relevance, the vernal equinox to, so I mean, I'm not explain, able to explain why he's made that decision. I'd have to go back to stuff I looked at a long time ago, but uh -huh. this isn't to dispute the other way of corresponding it. It's just that throwing yeah. that out there is a, <laughs> I think that there's possibly got to be reason behind that. He, he knows his stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I can see it. I can see what he's getting at. It's uh, it would be the, the five, that's a uh, five ingredients. So you'd have all your elements plus the the spirit, uh, and those are like the primordial ingredients to the the springing of life coming forward from there. So it does. Yeah, it's like the rest of the wheel doesn't kickstart until you have all those components. That's yeah. a good, really good way of putting it. Yep, I totally see where he's getting with that. Because uh, the planets, logically, he would correspond them to uh, fool to Uranus, Mercury to the magician. Moon to High Priestess, Venus to Empress, yeah, and Mars to Emperor. So yeah. you kind of do have like all, all the stuff needed to mix it up right there. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great point. Uh, so from this point, the uh, the num numerologically, we actually skip over uh, Aquarius, and it is kind of advanced insight as to why. I think I've kind of got a finger on the pulse. Uh, and I can maybe articulate it pretty well. So High Priestess is card number two. We jump over Aquarius and we land on the Empress card in Pisces here. And I think the reason we overlook, we overstep this chasm, you could think of this as uh, it, later in our life, it would be crossing the abyss. But when you're a child, you have no idea that you're teetering on the edge of oblivion every moment of your life. You're innocent. You're clueless that you're, uh, you, you have no fear of the potential of death. You know, that what they used to call putting the fear of God in you. That's just not there. So you're oblivious. You're, uh, so we're going to jump over Aquarius because later on, the symbols of Aquarius are so, de so deep. I think it represents uh, Saturn returning and finding out that there is more to this realm than you uh, first saw when you were uh, a neophyte when you were new. So that's just a kind of a teaser for why we skip Aquarius on the first pass through and we get to the Empress card. And uh, then we go across. Uh, so the Empress card is uh, basically Southern California um, and uh, uh, Arizona and uh, I think New Mexico over here. Um, and we'll, I'll, I'll substantiate this again as we come back through. But then we cross over the equinox, the spring equinox, and we're in the emperor card. And the emperor card is very broad and vast. It, it covers Denver, Nevada, Northern California. It even has much to do with uh, uh, Oregon and uh, Washington State. Did I get that? Washington State and Oregon um, are both included in the sun card. And then it, the next uh, station of the Zodiac is the uh, uh, Taurus. And we go from the Emperor card into the Hierophant is card number five. And then we uh, breeze up into the Lover's card, card number six, up here in uh, Gemini. And then the Chariot card. Happens is, to be right there where the Twin Cities are at. You got it. Yes. The, the Gemini. Of Gemini. Yep. You totally got it. Uh, and even Minai Soda, Jim Minai Soda is right in the Gemini card. Um, so then we come across the uh, summer solstice and we are into Cancer. And Cancer has correspondence to the Chariot card. Then we cross into Leo. Leo is correspondent to the Strength card. And I'll show visuals of these cards on the next pass through. Uh, then we cross into uh, Virgo is the Hermit card. Um, and this is where, obviously, every, I mean, everybody sees this one is Virginia lining up with the Virgo card, both of the Virginians. 
very gratifying to see that, you know, uh, correspondence again. Then we drop down under the uh, fall equinox line and we are in the sign of Libra. And there is uh, the Wheel of Fortune card and generally what is called the Justice card uh, down in the Libra, the sign of Libra. And then we drop a little further along into Scorpion and the Scorpio has the Hanged Man number 12 and the Death card number 13, all very powerfully correspondent with Florida. And I'll get into some of that, uh, substantiating that. Um, then we flow across into Sagittarius, back to where we started. And now we're going to lay the second layer of these cards on top of the first layer. And just a quick explanation of why the summer months only have one card per station. The three months of, the, uh, of Cancer, Leo, and Virgo, I believe that those are uh, only have one card because they are shorter nights. There is a... Uh, an abbreviated or truncated expression of the heavenly dynamics in the sky at night. Wow. That's a really interesting perspective, actually. Yeah. And so, and that also, uh, if the night is short up in these months, then the opposite is true on the opposite end of the spectrum, adding to the reasoning to making Aquarius so deep and giving extra depth to the depth of the this time of year, and maybe why we stepped over that, that deep part, that darkness. We overlooked the darkness as a neophyte, as a beginner. And as you go further and further in the progression of life, you come to realize the, uh, this Aquarian uh, subtle reality, you know, such as gamatria, uh, such as the fact that, you know, the Zodiac is very important. It's very meaningful. And when you're a kid, you took it as a joke, <laughs> but it's not a joke. It is pretty serious stuff. Uh, so the temperance card corresponds with Sagittarius, uh, giving that second layer to the Sagittarius of, of outside of the Magi. I put the Magi more inward in the temperance in the second layer. I kind of put it uh, further out from the fool. Uh, further out in the, like a shell, uh, a Fibonacci spiral, if you will. So Temperance card is here under Magi, um, having a lot to do with uh, Panacea Florida. Uh, the Temperance card is sometimes depicted with a mixing bowl, mixing up uh, the elements. Um, so then we cross over the Mississippi and we are dealing with the Devil card, number 15. Uh, and I have a whole lot to say about the devil card being representative of Louisiana, where a lot of uh, uh, slave culture and uh, also very eccentric spiritual expressions of humanity <laughs> dwell in Louisiana, you know, voodoo for one. And I'm not yeah, saying people aren't afraid to hex each other down there. Yeah. Yeah. So having the devil in Louisiana probably makes sense already for a lot of a lot of people. Uh, so now we're going to give uh, the two layers of Aquarius. Now that we're coming out of Capricorn in Louisiana, which, you know, look at how Louisiana almost looks like the Capricorn sign. Can you see it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the Capricorn, That's interesting. The that Capricorn sign looks like Louisiana to me. It's even got that frilly weirdness on the toe of the foot. It's so funny. So, uh, Moving into Aquarius, uh, Aquarius is definitely most of Texas. And this makes a lot of sense uh, considering the JFK assassination taking place in Dallas uh, in, the, in that dark night of the soul. Uh, the the heading of John. Time of the year, yep. John yep. is Aquarius. Aquarius, you got it. Uh, so many significant events having to do with um, with not just Texas, but I should also uh, point out like Oklahoma and Arkansas, have, <laughs> they, they've had some uh, towers getting blown up, some buildings, we'll get into that uh, later, some towers getting blown up, some very dangerous uh, crossing of the abyss, we could say, and all through this stretch, right through here. I'm just it, thinking about the star card. Uh, yeah. With Texas, the Lone Star State. <laughs> touchdown, baby. Touchdown. The Cowboys, you got it. They've got that star on their helmet. 
so then we, uh, coming out of Aquarius, we're back uh, on the second layer of Pisces, and it's the moon card. And I definitely put the moon card on Hawaii. And that is a really fun one. There is so much going on with that. And, uh, you know, all of these, each one of these stations is a whole video in and of itself. So just so everybody knows, we are really just trying to bring the highlights uh, to the show for everyone. So then we jump from the moon card number 18 uh, into the sun card number 19, which you and I, we got a lot to say about that 18, 19. And um, I, I point out, I always point out that Akhenaten is Akzeng Nuitzeng. The name of Akhenaten is moon and sun, uh, numerologically. So there's a lot going on with that. Also, Solomon, Sol and moon, the sun and the moon. Uh, so yeah, these guys are putting themselves, these royal names, emperor, empress, you know, Solomon and Shiva, uh, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, all have very powerful correspondence with the moon, the sun, emperor, and empress. So uh, yeah, it's cool. almost like you would create California with that shape just to just to reflect the alchemical merger going on with the human collective mind out of yeah. California and out of Hollywood. The yes. merger of the human mind with uh, putting a fiction into their reality and making them confuse the two. Yeah. You know, I even I, from now on, I'm going to call it San Francisco. You know, because it's in this uh, the sign of the sun card. Um, but then, uh, so jumping from number 19, the sun card, we go to number 20 is the judgment card, which is the second layer of Taurus uh, out just above the Hierophant. And then this one, I my graphic needs adjusting here. The world card should be outside of the lover's card, further up. But it's uh, essentially Canada it has to do with the Polaris and the Pole Star. Um, so that's a quick riff through the map. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's a quick run through just to give people like a, a glimpse of how I organize the Zodiac to the tarot cards. And then I have another visual with actual tarot cards on the locations. And I've, uh, this is a, a conglomeration of different tarot cards. They're, um, not all necessarily Rider weight. They're not all necessarily, you know, Thoth deck. This is a hodgepodge of the tarot cards. But this gives another, bringing more uh, substance to these ideas for people uh, visually. So you can see the Fool is in the middle, drops down to the Magi, to the Priestess. We skip to the Empress, number three. Then the Emperor, number four, in the, at the spring with Aries. The Hierophant here. Uh, then we go to the Lovers, number six. Seven is the Chariot. And people are going to start seeing these things making a lot of sense when they see the lion next to Maine, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, right. And the capital city of Maine is Augusta. So, and then we got... Oh, the yep, and that's for people that didn't, or not quick on the uptake there, August. Augusta, that's the time of Leo, which is the strength card with yeah, the lion on it. Yeah, the layers of this is is really fun to like just kind of slowly lay it on people because it is a lot to take in. Well, we're so, talking about 22 cards in 50 states. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities here. <laughs> yeah. Long, long examination. You'll be finding correspondences to this for years, I bet. You are, yeah, you're correct. Totally. <laughs> So uh, and so then we go into this hermit card, which I really like this hermit card. I don't know what deck this is from, but it's just one of my favorites. He's got a staff. He's in the cave surrounded by stars. There's actually stars on the cave wall. Uh, but then we jump under the fall equinox and we are in the sign of Libra and we get the wheel card number 10. And we got number 11, generally number 11, the justice card in Libra also with the scales of justice. And then we drop across into uh, Scorpio and we get the hanged man first, number 12, the death card, number 13. Um, and then we uh, are putting the second layer now onto um, 
the the uh, where we started with Sagittarius here. This is the Temperance card. I've got the Pope sitting on his throne. That's the Pope on the toilet <laughs> down here. And the Devil card in Louisiana. And then we've got the Tower card in basically Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and the Star card um, down here on the outer layer of uh, we're at Aquarius. Then we move up into Pisces and we're on the outer layer, the second layer, we're on the moon card, which has two pillars generally with a couple of dogs howling at the moon and a river stream going up into the mountains, um, often with a lobster or a crawdad, crayfish in the stream. Um, and we jump across here, we've got the sun card. This is, uh, I'm pretty sure this is Perseus riding on Pegasus. And Pegasus bridges quite a few, I think he's uh, more internal to the constellations, so he bridges through uh, Pisces, he's a little bit in Aquarius as well. Pegasus, yeah, I bet you could uh, actually expand this out to the whole constellational yeah. network, not just the ecliptic. Right, yeah, and I think one thing that's kind of cool is, can you see that, uh, let me roll in a little, can you see that, uh, what, Let's see. Sorry. Oh, no. There. Okay. Can you see that the horse is going off the card? You can't see the legs. Right. And I think that indicates that it is broaching past the borders of the sign of Aries, that it stretches into these other domains as well. I just think that's just a kind of an interesting detail to this card that the horse the legs are cut off and that's because the legs of pegasus expand into other territories below just interesting ideas i think um, yeah and the um, the sun really represents more than just specifically aries the vernal equinox itself and just yeah. that word vernal is where we get the words for like verify <laughs> nice. or something that is true and correct. Yes. You know, so the, all things are known in the light of the sun. So of yep. course it's really going to have influence over everything that follows that vernal equinox, all the life that springs from that light nice. in a way, anything yeah. having to do with individuation and distinction, the sun is going to be playing a role archetypally in that because you need the light to be able to distinguish. Nice. Well said. Yeah, man. Uh, and uh, one thing I like to point out um, is how the sun, you know, see how it has the squigglies and then the straight, uh, squiggly, straight, squiggly, straight, alternating uh, with the beams of light coming off the sun. Uh, I see that as representative of Medusa, which Perse uh, Perseus is holding the head of Medusa. And that will be kind of a key ingredient because I've done a lot of research on Medusa and the Echidna and the She-Viper and all of it tying into the Jesuit order. And so people who know the Jesuit sun will recognize that alternating squiggly beam, straight beam as very Jesuit-esque. And I think it all ties into Medusa, one of the Jesuit uh, dark goddess figures. So just something that will come up later, planting that seed now. And then the judgment card up here is blowing a trumpet. It has horns. It's much like a Taurus has horns on the sign of Taurus. Um, and then completing everything here with the world card. I'm going to jump out of this screen real quick. Nice. Hey, kitty. <laughs> <laughs> Cat decided it wanted to be on screen. Awesome. Hello, Gandalf. <laughs> So I'm going to start with the world card, and I've made these graphics to uh, just bring forward, like, um, well, first I'll start with uh, just the original world card that people can look at uh, without any of my uh, alterations put on it. So it's, this is called, called the robed figure. And one thing that uh, one of the beautiful things that I believe I got from uh, listening to Michael Tazarian is the fact that, you know, we obviously we have the four 
the quatrefoil, the four winds, the four royal stars uh, going on in the four corners. But Michael brought forward this shape of the three. She's got the three here, right? The robe makes the shape of a three. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely part of it. Yeah. So the three to the four. Uh, is card number 21, which card, is a three. You got you it. Add two to one. Two, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the layers of meaning are really uh, gratifying. Let me see if I can do quick skips. Okay, nice. So here is uh, the same world card. And some of the icons and symbols uh, from the territories map, uh, from that extreme northern, uh, north central uh, orientation of the map, uh, this is the symbol for uh, this is the Saskatchewan flag, and uh, so many really meaningful symbols overlap from the flag onto the tarot card. And so you can see this shield here has four corners in this cross, four segments, and then it has the three leaves down below. And so that corresponds very powerfully with the four corners of the world card and the three of the, uh, the robed figure here. And uh, so, uh, the four to the three, uh, it has to do with the quadrivium and the trivium as well, um, having to do with DC um, and that sacred number seven, which uh, is kind of orients to a lot of, uh, has a lot of gematra logic going on to it. But this is the ayin, which is Hebrew for seven. This is the eye in the sky. Seven is ayin, and the eye in the sky looks like this. Uh, image down below here with the uh, North Pole, the uh, North Pole. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a time-lapse image. People have probably seen this before where the camera's pointing at Polaris, the North Star. Yes. And the rest of the dome makes this swirling vortex around the still point of the Pole Star, which right. gives you kind of like an eye-in-the-sky effect for sure. Yeah, and this wreath that the robed one is standing inside of, this vortex, that she's inside of is very much indi indicative of this, uh, the swirling of the uh, stars in the heavens in that location. And she's standing still in the center of it. Uh, and she's got poles in her hand. Uh, so yeah, just very, uh, very fun correspondences, uh, how the three and the four adds up to an ion, and she is like an eye in the sky uh, at that pole star location. So let's see, I'm gonna skip. This is a quick flash to the world card up. I'm yeah, we're really, we're getting close to the end of the first hour. So okay. what we're starting to break into is what the second hour is gonna be largely like, taking a look at evidence from different parts of this mm -hmm. territory's map. And, you know, before we get into that, uh, I think that it's again important to reiterate that this is not a concrete thing in the sense that, you know, there's going to be some bleed over and overlap and mm -hmm. these lines are more fuzzy than firm in terms of dividing lines and demarcations. And I think that that reflects nature too, because sometimes you hit the vernal equinox and it's supposed to be springtime, but maybe you get another snow later than you thought. And well said, well said. You know, so that's this is fuzzy. <laughs> We're talking yeah. about a spectrum of archetype, and nature has a lot of wiggle room within this, yeah. But it is the general flow of things and can be applied as such. And mm -hmm. again, another reason to not be like rigid about our thinking is that that's just not how nature works. Nice, very well said. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, one, th one thing on that point is a realization we had a couple weeks ago about Yalda Bayoth that character who is a lion-headed snake god uh, from Gnostic uh, <clears throat> uh, worldviews. One thing that we realized is that Leo, the constellation, is right next to Hydra, which is a snake character. And when you blend them together, like you were saying, when you make them fuzzy, they come together and they converge to make Yaldabaoth flying around in that August station of the of the heavens. 
Uh, so yeah, we're definitely taking uh, different elements from the world of forms uh, from the heavens and blending them and trying to give them substance and explanation. And they and they are the foundation of so many of our stories uh, that you know when we do our Marvel decodes, uh, this these are some of the major ingredients of. Uh, you know, de-occulting the mythology of our of culture, taking the cult out of our culture. <laughs> yeah, buddy, cool. Yeah, looking forward to the next Marvel decode. We're gonna talk Spider Man. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna. Be Although with all the other stuff we got planned for this week, like real life stuff, we're gonna hang out in the real world with some other people that we know from the internet but haven't met in real life yet. So, yeah. wow. Don't know when we're going to fit in our Marvel decode. It might have to fall outside our regularly scheduled last Sunday of the month thing, but we'll get to it because I know we're really excited for that one. Yeah. And geez, it's like we're, we do a lot of content together all of a sudden. I appreciate how you're just ready and available with new ideas and insights all the time. And I can constantly exploit you. Thanks, buddy. Oh, yeah. My pleasure, <laughs> buddy. My pleasure. Yeah. And I just love how we're, I mean, we're coming out of the underworld out of this internet underworld and we're going to actually materialize just like Tazarian was saying, you know, the elements are coming together and it's time to, uh, to meet up in the, in the meat space as they're calling it these days. Meat space with their meat suits. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. So at the end of the first hour, I'll make the disclaimer that we may, we may get more than an hour in the second half of this conversation, depending on how long it takes Gabriel to go through everything and how much I layer onto it. So sign up to the Rockfin, sign up to the Patreon, one of those things if you want the full uncut version of this chat. And definitely find Gabriel on his Telegram channel. I'll make sure to link that in the show notes. Really fun place to go continue the synchro mysticism explorations all day, every day. And in, no, no doubt you need to be subscribed to Slick Dissident on YouTube. And man, we got to get you some ways set up for people to like actually support you with <laughs> physical yeah. resources of some kind or digital, yeah. right? Because you're doing really good work and your influence is definitely reaching a lot farther than people could probably measure mm -hmm. because there's all kinds of shows that, you know, you're one of those teachers of the teachers, I think. And so maybe your subscriber count doesn't reflect how far your information might end up traveling through the interwebs and echoing and bouncing around and expanding and expanding. I think that we're just seeing the beginning of that process because you're kind of new to the scene, but very original thinker. And I definitely appreciate it. This has been a really good setup. And this yeah. is one of those episodes where really the first hour, the free hour was just setting up for the fun part where we go through all the mind blowing real world significance of how this actually plays out. And is there anything you would say to add to that, to get people, you know, enticed to come see the rest of it? Uh, well, yes. Uh, you come check out the Slick Dissident channel. Uh, I'm actually probably going to start uh, putting in a, a, a new approach to it uh, more, you know, with some of the updates and upgrades and more substantiation uh, that I've uh, pulled into this uh, project. And also, uh, you know, I've been thinking about it, you know, maybe T-shirts are in order, maybe uh, some pins or some hats or uh, uh, car, uh, some car smell good, little Christmas trees for your car, <laughs> car deodorant or whatever. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll see what we can uh, get out to share with the people. Uh, uh, like we said, to get into the meat space and spread spread the knowledge but yeah come check me out on uh, slick dissident and also on the weaving spiders on saturdays weaving spiders welcome on youtube also need to get them into some other places too but you know producer shop talk aside it's going to be fun second hour hope to see a lot of you there and over on saturday nights when we weave thanks gabriel see you on the other side much love everybody All right. So there you go, guys, the tarot Tories. I would say in full, but there's probably <laughs> in full <laughs> territories in full, but there's really no end to this particular vein of syncretism. I'm pretty impressed that this entire system is just born out of the imagination of our buddy Gabriel. 
amazing stuff and not the only cipher that he's innovated that seems to have huge application and correspondent significance. So thank you, Gabriel, for bringing this to the show and for all the awesome research you do and for being such an awesome buddy. <laughs> uh, I'll talk more about that in a second, but in case you didn't see the plus extension of this episode, instead of your usual two hours, it's a three hour show in total. So if you get into my Rockfin or my Patreon, it's two hours additional information where the first hour we really, in the free section, we are only able to kind of set up the system and what it means and how it's all laid out. The second two hours or the, you know, plus extension, we went card by card and looked at as many details as we could cram in there that seemed to support as, I don't want to say evidence because it's not like we're proving a case here, but are just interesting. It's interesting to see how all these ideas really do connect into a big web. I hope you guys check it out. You can get on my Rockfin in the show notes or my Patreon. Rockfin is $10 a month, but you get all the other creators premium content on the network. Really worth it. Patreon's only five bucks a month and you get all of my content, including archives that haven't made it on Rockfin yet because they're older. And there's some gems in there too, let me tell you. And I'm going to try to be brief with this outro because it already was such a vast conversation. And I'm a little content stipated. <laughs> I need to get this out because there's a lot more on my plate. Really good stuff too. Uh, so I'll just say, I got to give thanks, praise, and the most honor to our community member, Snake Jones. He had myself and Gabriel and our friend Rachel and also Martin, who you may know from the Flow State episodes we do on Weaving Spiders. Welcome. We all got together at his farm in Missouri, not far from where I live, and had a nice weekend in a place where you don't have cell phone coverage. So we were walking around the woods and picking up sticks and playing with dogs. And my dog got to go chase chickens around and we had bonfires every night. I really can't encapsulate the beauty and majesty of all that in a short outro here, but it'll probably come up because these were lifelong memories for years to come. I'll be reflecting on beautiful, beautiful experience. And I really, really, I would say I hope to see, but I know I'll see more of these type of connections in the real world in meat space happening as our tribe grows and expands. I love it so much. I would, love, I would really like to meet everybody that was into our community here and the work that we do together. And I guess my work, because I'm the, the host here, but it feels like everybody's work. You know, I couldn't do it without every guest that comes on and brings us their research and blows my mind like this one. So I'm going to keep this outro shorter on the short side. I'd still be, uh, you know, wrong if I didn't remind you that we could do some one-on-one -on -one sessions together. Check my website for more information on that. Oracle cards, spiritual guidance, and sound healing. Get on my schedule. We'll have a real good time getting your chakras aligned. And it works great. Definitely want to see more of you sign up. Thank you to everybody who's come to me for sessions and enjoyed. I've enjoyed those connections. And I know that everyone else has too. They've been great every time. So I'm going to forgo the usual playing music at the end. And in the video version, there won't be the fancy graphics I normally make. I'm probably just reuse an older version just because I need to get this one out. And there will be so much more to come. And I know nobody's going to blame me for streamlining the production on this one. But for some reason, I feel like I got to make those disclaimers. I don't know. But hey, I love you all. Have a great time out there wherever you are. And keep sharpening that symbolic literacy. It's our first line of psychic self-defense. And we need everyone, as, everyone out there that we can to speak this twilight language and the language of the birds, the green language, and reveal as much as we can about this conversation that we're always eternally having with the archetypes. It's very valuable stuff. So thanks for tuning in. Hope you check out the two hour extension on Rockfinner Patreon. Much love to you all out there. Talk to you soon.